He was once referred to as the modern P.T. Barnum. He was the man that the legend Muhammad Ali once called the White Muhammad Ali. This icon has broken over 100 bones in his body, attempted to jump an entire section of a canyon, and is known as the godfather of all extreme sports. The superstar is none other than the great Evil Knievel. Born Robert Craig Knievel in the mining city of Butte, Montana on October 17, 1938, Evil was one of the first two children born. His surname is of German origin. His great-great-grandparents on his father's side emigrated to the United States from Germany and on his mother's side from Ireland. The boys were raised by parental grandparents Ignatius and Emma Knievel. From a young age, Evo was fascinated with motorcycles and pushing the limits. He credits Joey Chipwood, Auto Daredevil show he attended when he was a child as inspiration for his later feats. He would ride his dirt bike around the mining city, usually at breakneck speeds and never missing an opportunity to show off for others in the neighborhood. Even though Evil Knievel grew up in a heavy Catholic community, he was certainly no saint as a youngster. There are stories of him yelling fake newspaper headlines in order to sell newspapers. The high school dropout was caught trying to steal hubcaps and was given the choice of jail time or joining the military. Needless to say, he chose the service. When he returned from his stint in the military, he married Linda Bork and had his first son, Kelly. He had lived sh several short while jobs while trying to make ends meet for his young family. He worked as a drill operator for the Anaconda Mining Company, but was later fired from the company for trying to pull a stunt using the drilling equipment. His wild and reckless ways were far from behind him, as evident when he wrecked his motorcycle while trying to outrun the police. As the story goes, he was brought to jail following this event, and his cellmate was William Knoffel. The police referred to the couple as Awful Knoffel and Evil Knievel. Evil has five sisters, and he has uh, one brother. And uh, my brother Nick was the second oldest. Um, Bob was the oldest. And growing up in Butte was a lot of fun. There was always something to do and um, a place to go. A typical family night for us would be to go when the A and W Ruger stand was down on Continental uh, Drive, we would my dad and mom would load us all up in the car and we would go get a root beer and then we would go to the hills. Uh, there were tailings, um, it kind of now where the, the where the pit is, and um, closer to the East Ridge, there were tailings there, and they could ride up that and um, up those you know a steep hill and they would do flips and they would also come down and there would be a number of them um, that would do that and it was always a lot of fun. And I really never did even think about the fact that it might be someone might get hurt or it was scary because that's just what we did. So later on, my dad was also a motorcycle enthusiast and he would ride with a group of friends. We lived for, in the Bay Area for a while and he would ride in a club and interestingly he was, um, he actually belonged to a club called the Hells Angels, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about. And, but at that time, it was just a group of regular guys that would ride on the weekends or after work. It, it, you know, there after, uh, after a while and after a time, they began to get a little bit on the rough side. But this was before any of that uh, had taken place. But... One day when my dad was at work, uh, Bob decided, and I think that he was probably maybe 12, 13, or 14, and he decided to take his motorcycle for a ride. And we lived um, in the hills above Oakland in a small town called, called El Sobrani. And if you know anything about that area, he, he took the motorcycle out without anyone knowing and drove across the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, that was, that was quite a few miles away from my parents' home, and nobody knew where he was. But, you know, he really was his whole life kind of uh, known to do things like that on a kind of daring or, you know, something that you wouldn't expect. Uh, Evil was very active in sports. However, he, I don't know that you would say he was a good group sports person. So I would say he was athletic. Um, 
not only in skiing or anything that he chose to do, he was also, um, as far as motorized as cars and motorcycles and, you know, whatever it might be, he was, he was gifted in that area also. He was very talented. He was always participating in something it seemed like we were the spectators and he was the, he, you know, he was the main attraction. And that was pretty much how it ended up the rest of his life. I think that he, I think that he really enjoyed the attention. The earliest memories of him as a stuntman was I think that it was around uh, the late 1960s or maybe mid 1960s where he formed, uh, he had a group of friends and he formed a stunt show and he took it out on the road and he would make um, the car to, or the ramp to ramp jump over the cars or semis or whatever gimmick they could come up with. And um, he also would jump a motorcycle. Um, he would jump up in the air and, and jump over a motorcycle with a guy uh, with a guy driving it right straight at him, say it like at you know eighty or um, you know ninety miles an hour, and then with that he would jump up in the air, and um, he would just, he would straddle the motorcycle and the rider. Of course, the rider, you know, would have his head um, tucked down, um, you know, by the bars. But it was quite an athletic feat. So. For 37 years I've worked with the Knievel family, both Evil and Robbie, and seen some of the most exciting things that you could ever imagine in life. I guess the biggest thing about Evil is people that, that, that people don't understand are the important things that, that he did do for Butte, Montana. You know, it didn't matter if it was a Learjet, uh, a yacht, um, a sky cycle, a motorcycle, they all had the name Butte, Montana put on the side of them, the richest hill on earth. So I'm very proud that, of the fact that he did come from the city of Butte. He With his all or nothing attitude towards life, it was only a matter of time before Evil Knievel found his way to Las Vegas. And what an entrance he made. On December 31st, 1967, thrilling a crowd at Caesars Palace by jumping the fountains on his Triumph motorcycle. Walking down that hallway with the Evil and walking out the front doors of the, of the of Caesar's Palace was probably one of the most amazing things I've ever seen because of the, the, the amount of people and the fountains were, were blowing and you're thinking to yourself, you know, that's, that's what we're here to do tonight is conquer these fountains without getting killed. The injuries at Caesar's Palace are shocking. Evil Knievel breaks over 40 bones and is in a coma for 30 days. He never attempted the jump again, but the legend of Caesar's was born. Evil was a kind of guy that if he said he was going to do something, he was going to do it. I can remember the first time that he said he was going to jump to Grand Canyon, it was like, yeah, right, he jumped to Grand Canyon. And, and of course, with the Indian Affairs and, and uh, the FAA, that was put to rest really quick. And that's when he decided that, that we'd go after and look at the Snake River Canyon. The time came when he made a date and, and announced it on um, ABC World, Wide World of Sports. And then pretty soon, you know, we were all there at the Snake River Canyon. And I probably have to say that that was the most stressful moment in my entire life. You know, and then it was time that they made the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, and he took off. And it was the most unbelievable sound. And it sprayed us. It was a steam rocket engine. And it sprayed us with this warm... Uh, water spray and um, so it was it was terrifying whoa it looks like a good one whoa oh, evil stay with the bird he looks like he's whoa there's been a mistake he looks like he's going into the canyon the ship's going down it's it's going down it was 
total chaos. Everyone was running and screaming everywhere. Uh, one of my great aunts had a heart attack. Um, his children, Kelly, Robbie, and Tracy, took off running, and um, we tried to gather them up in one place so that they wouldn't get pushed over the edge of the canyon because everybody was rushing to the edge to see what they could see. So he would have made it over that canyon if it wasn't for the parachute blowing the, the, the cover off of the rear of that parachute and the wind blowing the direction it did. If the wind was blowing the opposite direction, it would have carried, carried him way over the, into the other field. But the way it was, the wind, he had, he had cleared the, the river and uh, the wind pulled the chute back to the other side. So he, he actually hit the side that he took off on and landed in the river. And luckily, uh, 15 minutes later, he came up on a helicopter and was alive. And it was pretty amazing to think that that someone could have just survived that. And um, brought him back up to his dressing room and um, we all um, went inside and <laughs> he, <laughs> I'll never forget the look on his face. I mean, it was, the, it was just, um, it was just the biggest shock I've ever, the shock look on anyone's face that I've ever seen. And he just couldn't believe it. He was almost speechless. But he really did get out of that one without much injury. Of course, it was a failed attempt, but probably that was the second most um, famous uh, jump. How I ever made it, how I ever lived is just a miracle. In every adversity, there's an equivalency to benefit if you just look for it. And as far as I'm concerned, if I'd have made it across the canyon, everybody would have said, well, it's easy, I could have done it. If I'd have died, they'd have said, well, the daredevil died. Evil can evil, that was his grand finale. But excuse me, I didn't, I'm still alive. It was real typical to see him um, with a cast on or walking with a cane. And he never did do what the doctor said. He would always leave it on for a few weeks and then he would take the cast off and everybody would be upset with him because you know he never really let himself heal properly. So I'm sure you know he had a lot of aches and pains beginning you know, more early in life than most of us would, and so he really struggled with that. And, um, he started from nothing, and um, he pursued, he built this, you know, created this character. It's almost like a cartoon character. And a lot of the things he did, um, you know, went along with that. Um, it just developed into a real-life cartoon character. He was one of the most famous people in the world. They say that in the 70s, that the three most famous people in the world were Evil Knievel, Muhammad Ali, and the Pope. He had a deal made with Ideal Toys, and I can remember going to, going to the bank, and he said, Billy, hold on to this for me. And so we pull up in one of his Ferraris. He had a, a, a Ferrari Spider. And so we pull up in front of the bank and we walk in and I've got this deal in my hand. He goes, did you look at it? I says, no, because he had an envelope too. And so I looked down and, and it was like, I, I never seen that many zeros, but it was a check for $1,200,000. He had one in his hand that was, that was for $1,450,000. And that, they were royalty checks from the toy company. I used to always give him a bad time in the 70s because I used to call him the king of bling because he always had the gold chains and the, the big Rolex watches and, the, and diamonds and the yellow canary diamond that was six carat on one hand. And, and after he passed away, I, I received um, the ring. With, this is the, the pinky ring that he always wore that has the motorcycle with the, um, with the sapphires and, and the wheels and the rest of the diamonds with his initials EK. And then this was the Rolex that he um, he wore every day up until he died. And if you see, it's it's all the whole face of it is diamonds, and it has E K in the bottom of it that a jeweler had made. He lived a, a very high pressure life, a high pressure life to um, you know produce. He lived a big life, so he had homes and and boats and airplanes and. Um, to pay for and so I think that he was under a lot of pressure and I remember that about him I remember seeing that difference you know going from more of a carefree um, 
young family man to yeah, you know, being tied to those pressures, and you know, he really, he really built quite a big life for himself. It was amazing because he was the kind of guy that said, you know, if you fall down, you got to get back up. You know, that's what makes you a man. And he did it so many times; it was just crazy. Not only on a motorcycle, but on going to have millions of dollars to having nothing. And I mean nothing where, you know, we'd have to use our credit cards to put gas in the cars to get to Vegas. And, and um, you know, when he, when he passed away the last three years of his life, I mean, he did everything he could do to make it right with anyone he did, he, he wronged. You know, the, he, he always said, I made 64 million and I spent 69. Well, it was the truth because that was the days that um, were really tough. It, what, what really brought was the downfall of Evil's career was a book written by Shelley Saltman. It was called Evil Knievel on Tour. And this is actually a copy of the book. And in it, there are so many negative things said about Evil, his family, um, the city of Butte, that he wasn't, too, he wasn't too happy with. And so he decided to take it into his own hands. And he went and... Um, beat him up with a baseball bat and broke both of his arms. Well, to make a long story short, he ended up going to jail. And, and in jail, he wasn't the most, the best prisoner for sure. He'd uh, kind of do what he wanted to do and he'd get in a little bit of trouble and a judge would slap his hand. And, and then one day there was, uh, there was 47, I believe, inmates that were on work furlough. And so, you know, they, they all got to leave in the morning and come back at night. You know, go to their jobs and then come back at night. And, and Evil was one of those. So they, the, the guys are all waiting to leave and get in their bus or have their vans, take them where they had to go. And they look out and here's a whole roll of limousines parked out in front of the prison. So Evil sent 47 limousines to pick, take each one of them guys to work and bring them back that day which did not go over big with the judge. <laughs> so he ended up having to do, I think, another couple of weeks before they, uh, but um, that's the way he was, you know, he just, uh, he always had something going on in his mind. Evil Knievel was a heavy drinker, and in 1999, he had a liver transplant. I started a street the Evil Knievel way, and then, I thought, well, we'll have a festival for him when he was better, and so I started Evil Knievel Days. It was actually Evil Knievel Week, the first uh, the first show that we did, and we were only going to do one show, and then I carried it on our, our committee, and, and we, we did it for uh, uh, eight before I, I had quit, and it was the proudest days of his life. And This was one of uh, Evil's bikes that um, years ago we went down to a company called CMC, California Motorcycle Company, and we designed this motorcycle and we did the designing of the paint, the chrome, the way he wanted to, you know, he had to have the white seat, the evil Knievel on the side of it. Um, this was a seller, they only sold, well, there was a total of 42 of them that were ever built. And this happens to be one, we use this in, in uh, uh, the parade, the evil Knievel parade. And, and the bikes that he rode were XR750 Harleys. They were originally built for flat track racing, and um, but uh, that's what Evil decided to jump. So, you know, he, he went from American Eagles to to Harley Davidson back in 1969 or 1970. He passed away in uh, 2007, and he left a legacy with him that'll live on for forever. He he got up and he tried again, and I probably to me. That would be the legacy that I would want everyone to remember that no matter how bad or how good it gets, um, you know, you can still go on and you can still have a nice life, you know, if, if, you, if you choose to build it in that way. He was, uh, he was an inspiration. He took a lot of us younger people, you know, on the road and taught us street sense and, and um, you know, the... If I were to, to die tomorrow, I could say that I've lived a life that, is, that has been so fulfill, fulfilled with traveling. I'm in the process right now of building a statue uh, for the city of Butte that will be approximately nine feet tall of evil on the motorcycle doing the wheelie. And to keep the legend alive, 
here in Butte. Butte, Montana, the richest hill on earth, a mile high and a mile deep. Butte began as a mining town in the late 19th century. At first, only silver and gold were mined, but the rising need of electricity caused a large demand for copper, which was native to the area. Butte was a combination of circumstances that was produced by a mineral wealth that made many men rich, but most of all gave thousands of high-paying jobs. Immigration was popular, and this made Butte one of the largest, most diverse, and successful cities of its time. Immigrants were told, Don't stop in America, go straight to Butte. From a distance, Butte looked like any other mining town surrounded by mountains and trees. But unlike any other developing city, Butte has a heritage that is just as rich as the minerals that were mined here. 47 marks a very significant change in mining in Butte. Uh, Con Kelly was president of the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. Ore reserves were becoming more and more expensive to extract out of the ground, and it was becoming more problematic to see how the future would lay out for the Anaconda Company. Con Kelly and his mining engineering team determined that if they started to make big open cuts in the underground, that it would um, enable the company to extract lower grade ore for a profit. So they went from an underground stop and raise type of uh, mining into the, what Kelly called the Greater Butte Project and he developed the Kelly Mine to do, I'm losing my mind, block cave method of mining. The block cave method of mining opens big open caves where they extract all of the ore and then they put it through a process and hopefully get enough ore to make it profitable. The Greater Butte Project also saw some real development in the community to improve living environment for uh, miners, their families, and people who might be coming into Butte. The Anaconda Company invested in a new hospital, the community hospital. Eventually they uh, gave that to the uh, Sisters of Charity, I think for a very small uh, fee. And it was a new beautiful hospital over there on Clark Street, still is our hospital. Um, they also built things like the green apartments, housing, um, they tore down compromised housing and um, dilapidated buildings and they built new housing for people to live in. They developed what is now the drives out on the flat. It was very um, interesting time in our community. Um, block cave mining and then eventually open pit mining changed a great deal of our landscape here in Butte and um, a lot of people's houses were moved from Meaderville, McQueen and the northeast side and those people spread out onto the flat area and some out to Timber Butte, um, changing the whole center of the city eventually. So it really had a very dramatic impact on our urban sprawl. It also was a time that the miners felt a bit threatened. Um, underground mining was a highly skilled occupation and in the four, late 40s and, and early 50s to move from a highly skilled occupation to essentially being a truck driver was a little insulting. Miners got angry. They had a strike in 1951. Harry Truman had just come to Butte. Harry Truman uh, sent a message to uh, the Anaconda Company that he would impose the, Hart -Taftly, the Taft Hartley Act to make the miners go back to work in order to ensure that there was enough strategic metals to fund the Korean War. Um, that was a very interesting time here as well. Truman did impose that act. The miners did go back to work. It was another five or six years before they struck again, and when they struck again, 
It was probably one of the most uh, violent, longest strikes that this community ever saw. I remember also watching them tear down what was the Italian community in Butte called Meterville. It was where the pit is now, or the old pit, the one closest to Butte. So at the top of Main Street, just before you get up to Walkerville, at the, the mine that is on the left, just before you go to Walkerville, there was also a huge Christmas display that was put on by the Anaconda Company. All kinds of things. There were things to do all the time for kids. We didn't have any money, but we had things to do. We played. And the 50s were great times for me because I was, you know, I was in high school and a lot of dances and we used to, well, didn't have a car or anything, so we'd go to Gregson, so we'd hop the BAP. Beyond that, I remember very clearly as a child going to the Columbia Gardens, which is now where the new pit is. And it was just an elaborate, beautiful area filled with all sorts of rides. There was a roller coaster, there was a Ferris wheel, there was a uh, uh, merry-go-round. It was just really, really exciting. It's a shame that young kids today do not have the opportunity to go there because it was over the top. It was an amusement park like they have in big cities now. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Oh, the Columbia Gardens was fabulous. Uh, where I lived, I lived right this, where the buses are at now. We used to call it the car barns. And on Thursday they had Children's Day. And, and everybody, it was free. And I would lived right there by the car barn, so I could get out there and get on the bus first thing in the morning, they'd drive me right out to the Columbia Gardens, and then when I got on the bus, they dropped me off right at my house. So I was right next door to the car barns. <laughs> the Greeks, the Finnish people, the Germans, everybody had the pavilion up in the back. That wasn't the regular dance hall, but there was a picnic pavilion, and we go up there and dance. You watch them do all their ethnic dances up there. It was just just fabulous. The Lebanese, the Greeks, I mean, the Finnish people, the Germans, it was fun. We got up there to sit and watch them at nighttime, you know, doing their dances out there. It was really a lot of fun. The um, 40s and 50s are an interesting time here because it sort of was the last hurrah for the Butte Hill, I think. After that, mining uh, started to really wind down over the next 20 years, and it greatly impacted our current economic uh, base here. Red, the white, the blue And 
They say that this place could be the richest hill on earth. It's rich with good people and working men, and I know that's a fact for sure. Well, I'm real damn proud to be where I come from. It's a big sky country in the land of the setting sun. Something to say I'm proud to be from you